right, well, open your Bibles, if you would, to, uh, to the book of Psalms, and uh, we'll be in there just a just moment. Uh, this is part eight of a uh, of kind of a lengthy a lengthy series. Um, I say lengthy, but it sure isn't 50 parts. It's just uh, about nine or ten parts, and uh, we're getting close to wrapping it up. But this is part eight, the formula of prayer, and uh, we've already touched on the uh, several things that start with the letter F. We've talked on the the function and the foundation, the faith. We've talked about the fervency, the frequency. Last week we talked about the failure. We talked about the focus several weeks ago. And today we're talking about the formula, the formula. Now, uh, I don't know how many of uh, you really enjoyed school. Uh, I, was not, uh, I was not a schoolie. I did not necessarily enjoy school, not until I went to Bible college and I started studying something I thought was uh, beneficial, right? I know when, uh, when I was in uh, school, one of the things I struggled with was, was math. And uh, looking back, it wasn't such a bad thing, but the higher up in math I got, the more we had to remember these things called formulas. And uh, I wasn't good with formulas. I wasn't good in math. I wasn't good in well, science and history and social studies. Geography. I pretty much wasn't good at anything until I got to learn the Bible, and then I enjoyed that so much, I, I feel like I excelled. But, but I, I remember we had, to, uh, we had to memorize these formulas, and it was really neat, in a sense, because all you had to do is use the formula, and you got your answer. And as long as you remembered the formula, the answer... Uh, most of the time came out accurate. And uh, when it comes to prayer, there are these things we call a formula for prayer. Now, this isn't a, a magic potion, it's not a magic wand, this is just simply Bible. And, uh, and I hope that this is a blessing when it comes to knowing the formula for prayer in your life. So there are three things, essentially, that I want to point out to you this morning that I think will be helpful. First of all, and you'll have this in your in your verse sheets, the need for confession, the need for confession. Powerful prayer is the result of pure hands. And uh, if we are living a life that is, uh, that is unfit or unworthy, if we're living a life where we do not have pure hands before God, how can we actually ask him for things and expect a, a response? So we have to have these pure hands when we go to the Lord in prayer. This is the need for confession. One of the very first things that I do, I know when I pray, and I, I try, and I'm not perfect at this, I'd be lying to you if I said I was perfect at this. One of the things I like to do is when I begin to pray, I begin to confess my sin before the Lord. I want, I want a pure heart, I want pure hands. And I know that this brings power in prayer, but we go to the Lord and we begin to confess our sin before Him. And, and I think that the one thing this requires is, a, is humility in our lives. Confessing your sin is a very humbling thing and, and it ought to be the first thing we do when we go to the Lord in prayer. In Psalm 10, verse 4, it says that the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. And God is not in all his thoughts. Now confession comes from a humble heart. And when we go to God and we begin to confess our sins before him, we have, there's this thing called humility. You all know what I'm talking about. Confessing sin is always a very humbling thing. Uh, how many times have we had to go to somebody and, uh, and tell them we've done wrong? How many times have we had to go to somebody and confess our sin to them? And you know what? That's very humbling, isn't it? And we need to do that in order to have this pure heart and these pure hands before God. Now, I think that pride is what stands in the way of this humility. When we are so arrogant, when we are so proud that we cannot confess our sins before God, it, there's, a, there's a resistance and a hesitance for God to bless us as we would hope. So we have to have this confession. And I think that people, when, uh, they, they, people who are proud, they think they seek God. I believe it's, I believe it's, it's, uh, it's maybe their, their disposition. They, they believe that they're seeking God. But how can you seek God if you, are, if you are not humble? Because the essence of humility is submission. And so when we go to God, we say, God, I have done wrong and I have sinned and I want to be right before you and I'm confessing my sin. 
And when we do that, we are humbled. Well, how can we then as a people submit to God's way if we are so adamant about having our own way? We can't do it, can we? So we have to have this humility, this confession before God. Pride will be the thing that keeps our prayers from being answered. And ironically, humility will be what opens the doors of God's favor. When we are humble before God, in James 4, 6, note this verse with me, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the what? The proud, but he gives grace unto the who? The humble, you see, that's the key. The key is, is that we have humility before God. He's going to resist the proud. He's going to say, no way, you're not confessing your sin. You're not getting right before me. So he's going to say, no, I'm sorry, you just haven't even gotten right with me. We need to confess our sins. In Proverbs 16, 5, it says, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be humble, be humble in your lives, and there needs to be a a pivotal time in our lives where we have this uh, quote-unquote come-to-Jesus moment, right? When we can get down on our knees and we can confess to him and say, I have sinned before you, O Lord. How can we have answered prayer if we have not confessed the things we've done wrong before the Lord? Now let me give you a little application here. Proud people lack power in their prayer. Proud people lack power in their prayer. And there may be, I'm certain there, there is, and I don't know of anyone in particular, so if, if you think I know of something in your life, then, then, then you're wrong, but there are people, I'm sure, in this very room that have something in their lives that they need to confess to God and get right. That they need to get on their knees when they get out of this room and they need to ask God to forgive them for their sin, for their transgression against him. You want power in your prayer? You want a formula? It begins with confessing your sin and getting right before God. And I know that there are people in this room. Now, it's not all that hard to do. That's the, uh, the longer the formula got, the harder it became, you know? And I remember remember a a time I, I was looking at this huge chunk and there was so many brackets and parentheses and and there was, there, there was absent of numbers. It was just all letters, you know? And, uh, and you get a little distracted by that. You're looking at all this formula going, I have no idea what that is. You know, I, I think that's a, okay, so A and a B, and a, you know, you just kind of throw in the towel sometimes, and you say, it's just so complicated. Prayer is not complicated, but it begins with confession. We have to go to God, and we have to get right to Him. In 1 John 1, 9 and 10, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the next verse is really key because we know the Roman, in the book of Romans where it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here's an affirmation. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know what that tells me? That tells me that we all have sinned to confess to God. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. We all have a sin or sin in general to confess before our Lord. So the best thing you can do is before you get on your knees or right when you get on your knees, you just get out and you open and you say to God, Lord, I've got this wrong, I've done this wrong, and I've done this wrong, and I just just have to get right in my life. I have to get right in my life. We all have things that we should be confessing. And we shouldn't be asking for more from the person we've offended until we get right with him. I know in my life it would be be an insult if I, it it would just give you an example. So my kids, right? Let's just hypothetically, I don't think they've ever stolen from my wallet. Matter of fact, there's nothing to steal in my wallet. So I know this was just a a fallacious story. But uh, let's just say, for instance, they were to steal some money out of my wallet. And, uh, and say, because I'm dad, I'm all-knowing, right? So, uh, so I know that they stole money from me. They know that they stole money from me. And being an all-knowing, all-powerful dad, I know that they know they stole money from me. <laughs> 
And being smart children, the son of an all-knowing dad, they know I know they know. Everybody knows that they have stolen something from me, right? So let's say, for instance, I whip out my wallet, and I'm like, oh, I had a 20 in there. Now I just have 19 ones. This is obvious to me that somebody has stolen from me. The very first thing I do is consult my wife, and I say, honey, did you take the money? (laughs) I don't say that. I don't say that. I just give her her own money. And uh, so the very first thing I do is, um, is, is I'm offended because they have sinned against me. And now what right would they have to come to me and ask me for something, let's say money, if they have not restored to me? Now, I, I, restoration is a very hard thing in a biblical sense because how would you restore uh, something to God in this sense? I don't know. But let's just say, for instance, they come to me and 20 years from now, and they say, Dad, you know what? I really blew it. 20 years ago, I took something from your wallet. I took money from you, and I want to confess it right now. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Of course, I say, well, of course, children, I'll forgive you. Of course, I'm going to forgive them. Now they have free access to ask me for more money. You see how that works. Confession is a vital part of this process. They must confess their sin, and we must confess our sin to God. And I, and I tell you, we would, be, we would be a whole lot better if we would just get out in the open and just, just say it how it is before the Lord. And there are times, I'm telling you, when I just get on my knees and I say, Lord, I lusted, I coveted, I desired, and Lord, I just want to be right before you. And I am sorry, will you forgive me? Well, of course we know that he's going to forgive us. But without clearing that path, how can I have power in my prayer? I'm going to be lacking that power. The second thing, the second thing is uh, the need for calibration. The need for calibration. Now we need to be rightly calibrated both spiritually and scripturally. And can I, can I just note that, that a great start to being calibrated spiritually is your confession to God. If you want to be calibrated right, you go to God and you start confessing. You know what that does? That builds a sensitivity to your sin and your iniquity, your transgression against God. When you confess to him, I've done wrong, you then become more sensitive to that. And so spiritual calibration is the first thing we want to start with. In John 15, 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Notice the context of this verse is relating to the branch who is us in relationship to the vine, which is Christ. And as the branch is is abiding in the vine, it brings forth fruit. This is just, it just has to happen that way. A branch on the ground cannot bear fruit. It has to be attached to the vine, which is its life source. So as we abide in the vine, as the branch abides in the vine, it brings forth fruit. And notice in verse 7 what it says, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You just ask God. The fruitfulness of the branch is determined then by the faithfulness to abide in the vine. That's where fruitfulness comes from. Answered prayer comes from being attached to the one who is supplying the answer to the prayer. There needs to be this in our life, and there is no abiding. If there is no abiding, there will be no fruit. Spiritual people have their prayers answered. You notice how you you find that the more spiritual person is, you say, man, I don't even know how do you have all your prayers answered. You look at all of the, the, the giants of the faith, the giants of the faith, the ones who, who were mighty in preaching and prayer and, and were spiritually led by God. And, and you say, man, that guy, he can pray and, 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 and not just has the language of prayer, but he can pray, he connects with God. And man, he has prayers answered. Well, he's spiritually calibrated. Begins with confession And then this calibration, he's beginning to walk in the spirit. That's what spiritual calibration is. It's walking in the spirit. 
and having a relationship with the Lord. That's what spiritual calibration is. You walk in the Spirit, walk with the Lord, and you'll be spiritually calibrated. In 1 John 3, it says this, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Keeping God's commandments, being spiritually calibrated, produces fruit. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. We receive things of God because we have gone to him and we've confessed our sins. We become sensitive to sin in our life and then we are able to pray, calibrated, we're able to pray and as we, the branch, abides in Jesus the vine, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. So there needs to be this spiritual calibration, okay? Uh, secondly, there needs to be a scriptural calibration, a scriptural calibration. Uh, one commentator said this, if we would have power in prayer, we must be earnest students of his word to find out what his will regarding us is, and then having found it, to do it. The question is, is if we do not know God's word, how can we know God's will? Because contained within his word is his will for our life. So we have to study, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, study is not just to impress people. It's to impress God. It's to show God that you know him and that you, you begin to love him and you begin to study his word. And then the will for our lives pours out of his word. I've, I've, I've read, you know, before, and as you're reading, and you, you come across a passage, and, and you might be praying, and you're like, Lord, I just, I, just need to, I just need to know, I need to have an answer on this thing. And uh, you want the answers, you go to the person who has them, right? So you, you, you pray, and you begin to read, and you say, that's it. That's the answer that I was looking for, right here in his word. R.A. Torrey says that we must feed the fire of prayers with fuel of God's word. How do we, how do we feed this, this fire? Well, we fuel it with God's word. We, we begin to read and we begin to pray and we begin to, we begin to confess our sins and calibrate in a very spiritual way and now calibrate in a scriptural way. And we begin to look at this and we begin to, we begin to know what God's will is for our life. It's interesting, I, I find prayer... To be uh, to, to to kind of be similar a little bit to uh, to a Christmas list, except in reverse. You see, a Christmas list is I don't know when when you guys were a kid, uh, if uh, or maybe you still do it now. <laughs> maybe you still submit Christmas lists to your parents, and and that's a great idea. <laughs> Actually, you know they have never asked me to stop. So what I need to do is I need to just submit a Christmas list is what I need to do, and uh, hopefully they just pour on the blessings, you know. Now we have this, uh, you guys have Amazon? You guys know what Amazon is, small little company? <laughs> anyway, so uh, we have this thing called the wish list. And so in, the, in my wish list, and uh, hint, hint to all you church people, no, we, we have this uh, public wish list. And in it, it's just a bunch of books, you know? And, uh, and so my, my mom, every now and again, she says, is there anything in your Amazon account that you want? I said, well, all of it, of course, you know? So I just stack it up with books. And, and then I come to my senses and I say, you know what? I've got a wall of books. You know, just defer to my kids. Whatever they want, just give them that. I don't need anything. So, uh, but it's like a Christmas list. You see, you have this list, and uh, you submit it to your parents. Your parents review it, and uh, they say, oh, little Joey. They, uh, that's, I still have people in my family that call me Joey. Uh, I'll, I'll be fine with just pastor, though. But anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, they look at it. They, they say, well, little Joey, he wants, uh, he wants Legos. And so they buy me Legos. That's always a safe bet. If you've got kids that don't choke on Legos, because I think it's like three and up, just buy them Legos, they'll be happy forever. And, uh, you know, money does not buy happiness, but Legos have some part in it. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so, so they look at this, they say, well, Legos here, that's good. And they say, Little Joy wants a bike, and, and Little Joy wants this. And, and so, so, then, so then the parent gets a chance to pick from this list and determine what it is they want to give me, right? Well, it's kind of in reverse. You see, we have the word of God and we read the word of God and we pray in God's will and in his word and we say, Lord, we know that you want us to have this. 
It's easy to get something when we're asking for something he already wants to give us. So we just go to God and we say, Lord, we know that this is what you want for my life. And I can pray after I confess, being spiritually calibrated, now scripturally calibrated, I can pray in a way that pleases God. And I can get things from God. In John 14, verses 13 through 14, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So what we do is we go to God, we ask him for something that's in his will, that's, that's, that's tethered to his name. If we ask, it says in verse 14, if we ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we ask things in the Lord's name. And what does that mean? That just simply means for his name's sake, for his glory. We ask God, if this be the will of your life, for me, it will have, if this be the will for my life, if this is what you want me to have, I'm asking you right now, Lord, for it. And he's not going to deny you that. It's no different than the Christmas list. All we gotta do is look in this word of God and say, Lord, we know, I know that you want me to be a good husband. And I'm praying, Lord, that you would help me to be a good husband. Not for my wife's sake, but for his name's sake. I want to bear a good testimony. I want to be a good husband so that I can be a good example to my kids so that when they grow up, they can be a good husband to their wife. You see? I'm praying in his will, in his way. I'm praying in his name. And that's what we need to do. But you'll never know what to ask for if you aren't in his word. We can get distracted really easy with all this manner of prayers. Now here are some other things to consider real quickly. Uh, first of all, forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is something I don't think that we talk about much when it's concerned in prayer, but I think it's vital. In Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, now this, some people call this the Lord's Prayer. This is not a prayer the Lord prayed or else because he, he has no debtors. He has nothing to be forgiven of. So we know that this is a model prayer for the disciples. Ready for this? This is what he says. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness is a component in prayer. How many of us expect God to do something for us while we have not been out there forgiving other people who've wronged us? How many of us have bitterness in our own lives where we, where we, we literally, when we, when we wake up in the morning, we still bear this heavy burden of, of, of there are people out there who have done me wrong and I have not forgiven them. You know what it takes? It takes humility, doesn't it? It takes humility to go out there and say, you know what, I'm gonna forgive them. And what happens if they have not asked for forgiveness? You forgive them anyway. You say, Lord, I'm gonna forgive this person and they may never come to me. And I'm not, ask, I'm not gonna forgive them because, because I'm offended. I'm forgiving them because I don't want anything to stand in the way of my relationship with God. And so we have this forgiveness and we must, we must forgive those who have wronged us. One commentator says, I never knew a man getting a blessing in his own soul if he has not been willing to forgive others. You want to be blessed of God, you got to be out there and you got to be a forgiving person because there's a lot of people out there that do us wrong. It's just true. And we got to be willing to forgive them. Another thing we need to consider is thanksgiving. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Right? Listen to this. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is God's will. God's will for your life is that you're thankful, that you're thankful. In Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's a wonderful word. It's a wonderful word. Be thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. This is the will of God for our lives. How can we pray? Let me ask you this, just to stir up your soul a little bit. We, we pray and we ask God for things that we're not thankful for. Do you think he's going to keep on just piling it on? <laughs> if I give my kids a $10 bill and they look at me and they say, well, I deserve that, they're not going to get another $10 bill. Matter of fact, I'm still bigger than them. I'm taking that $10 bill back because I can. We need to pray with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for what you've already given me. 
Oh, uh, you know what? It might not seem like much, but there is a lot there to be thankful for. We go to God and we say, thank you, Lord, for this. And if I never get anything else, I can thank you for all eternity for what you've already given me. And if we were to keep a prayer journal of sorts, if we were to write down all of the things that God has done for us, if we were to, if we were to pro, or just write those things down on paper and, 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 may it ref, and bring it out every week, every day, and just look at them and say, thank you, Lord, for my health. And some of you say, well, I don't have a whole lot of health. But you had a lot of health in your life. You'd be thankful for the 90 years that you've been healthy. Thank you, Lord, for, for, for the health of my kids. Well, maybe they're not as healthy as what I wish they were, but they're healthy nonetheless. Thankfulness is a key component to having your prayers answered. This is a formula. We need to be properly calibrated. You see, here's the, here's the conundrum. When I was on the police department, we would have this, um, we'd have to tune our radars. We'd have to calibrate them. We had this little a little uh, tuning fork and you'd, you'd hit the steering wheel or hit something solid and the clipboard and, and you'd hold this thing up there, you'd turn on the radar and there's a, a process by which you tune this thing. And, uh, and if you didn't tune it at the beginning of each shift, two things would happen. One, you could have an inaccurate uh, radar. You, you'd have an inaccurate reading of people speeding. Secondly, the, the person can contest whether or not the reading is accurate. So there's a, there's a question in their mind, and you go to court and say, Officer, have you, uh, have you tuned your radar lately? And they're saying, well, I calibrated it last week. So it could be inaccurate. We have to calibrate our lives spiritually and scripturally, and we need to check this regularly. I can't say that, I can't say that enough. We need to check it regularly. If we calibrate spiritually and scripturally once a year, Christmas and Easter, if we calibrate once a month, the first Sunday or the last Sunday or, or maybe once in a while, the chances of having an inaccurate reading greatly increase. So we have to be scripturally and spiritually calibrated. Can I say this lastly, that we need to have confidence, the need for confidence in our prayers. Pray with confidence and expect an answer that God's going to hear your prayer. How can a person, though, pray with confidence if they have not confessed their sin to God? How can I stand in, in, in absolute confidence and say, Lord, this is my prayer, if I have not said, Lord, this is my sin? Please forgive me of what I've done. The way we build our confidence begins with confession. And then we have to be calibrated. How can a person, how can a person pray in confidence if it's not what God wants them to have? A lot of people, they, they, they get off track and they, they start to pray for things that just don't make any sense. And we have to pray, and when we pray in confidence, we get those things. Listen to this, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. We can go to God and we can pray confidently, this is the will of God for my life. Because I've looked at it in the scripture and I know this to be true. I'm living a pure life in front of God and I can go to him and I can ask him for things and be confident. I think it's clear that when we pray, though, we must believe that what we're asking we'll receive. This is part of the confidence that when we go to God, we can, we can ask him and we can, we can pray in faith, knowing that I'm asking something God wants to give me. I'm asking for something that he does indeed want me to have. In, in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. I think Christians sometimes pray with such a lack of confidence and they're really not sure if that's indeed what God wants them to have or not. And so they vacillate. And, and, and then they, they, they begin to ask themselves the questions, uh, does prayer really work because I'm not seeing a whole lot of answered prayer? So they're praying the wrong way, they're not getting an answer and then they throw the, whole thing, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
Sorry, Jacob. <laughs> Nobody's throwing Jacob out with the bathwater, okay? Not if John has anything to do with it. So we need to pray in, in, in confidence, knowing that what we're asking of God, he does want to give us. And if you're praying in God's will, what you're praying for has great value. Not like Walmart's great value. We're talking great value in the sight of God. And Jeremy Taylor said, consider what a huge indecency it is that a man should speak to God for a thing that he values not. If we're going to God, we're confessing our sins, we're calibrating our lives spiritually, scripturally, we're praying and we're forgiving people, we're thankful people, we're praying in confidence. The chances of having your prayer answered greatly increase. Greatly increase. And, and, and I would venture to say that it's a 100% done deal. You can pray this way and get your prayers answered. Because that's what God promised us. You say, well, I, well, I don't get all, all, all the, the answers to my prayers. Well, let me ask you the question, what, how are you praying? Let me look at your life. What are you praying for? What are your motives in your praying? If you're praying for a Porsche and you don't get a Porsche, don't blame that on God. Blame that on the Porsche dealer or, or your bank account or something. Don't blame it on God. Now, I have been praying for a Porsche. <laughs> Just kidding. My kids, they buy these little, these little cars Hot Wheels, and they were playing out here the other day in the dirt. It, it, it teleported me back like 25 years. I was sitting down in the dirt playing with the Matchbox cars. You guys, you do that, right? Yeah. Cooper, you don't play with cars? Oh. Hudson, what? Hudson plays the cars. I'm like, that's not Hudson, that's Cooper. I know what you're saying. Yes. I, I, I have not gotten on the ground yet to play with cars. I'm going to do it, though. You're going to take a picture, and then you're going to superimpose it, and Friends, we pray for all sorts of dumb things. It's true. We pray for all sorts of things that are, that are not in God's will for our lives. And the only way we know if they're not God's will for our lives is to be in his word, to be scripturally calibrated. And I just want to say this in conclusion, that God's a really good God. And he's not trying to hold something back from you. In Psalm 84, 11, and 12, it says this, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Walking uprightly, though, has something to do with confession and calibration and confidence in your prayer life. God is not trying to withhold things from you. He loves you, and he wants you to be part of his family. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that the God of the universe wants us to be part of his family. That, that's, that's, that's tremendous. You, you, you might ask yourself, do you, how, am I even worthy of that sort of love, that sort of affection, that sort of desire? Am I worthy of God loving me so much he wants me to be part of his family? And then we ask the questions, well, then what do I have to do? It's a great question. What do I have to do to be part of God's family? You know, it's, 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 real, it's real interesting. The adoption process has nothing to do with the kid. It has everything to do with the parent. It has everything to do with the, with the older person, the person who is mature and able to adopt someone, Right? It has nothing to do with a child. And salvation is that way. Salvation has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with what the Lord has already done. It has everything to do with God. If you're here today and you don't know where you will spend an eternity, this really is the most important part of the message. I preach on Sunday morning for 45 minutes so I can sum everything up in five minutes. This is the most important part. If you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? 
I want this hand to represent you and I, and I want this wallet to represent all the things we've done wrong. These are, these are uh, all of our sins, right? The, the, the things we've, we've, we've done that have offended God who loves us so much. And The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have this sin. We've all done things wrong in our life. And a lot of churches, a lot of churches think that, well, maybe if I just turn over a new leaf, maybe I'll be accepted into God's family. Maybe some people are saying, well, if I, just, if I just join a church, God will look at me and say, you have one favor in my sight, child. You now can go into heaven. Well, that's not it. What about giving money to the church? That's not it either. The Bible says that the wages of this sin, the penalty for this sin is death. Now watch this. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. It's not about praying a prayer or giving money to a church or walking an aisle in a church. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. Now watch carefully. If we try to pay for this sin, we will die and spend an eternity separated from God. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for our sin. It wasn't because we did something. It was because He did something. And the Bible doesn't say that you turn over a new leaf or you walk an aisle or you pray a prayer. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's the only thing you can do without doing anything at all. It's believe. Trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believe that he died on the cross to make the payment for your sin. And if you trust Jesus to make the payment for your sin, then when his death, his burial, and his resurrection prove that that payment, that trusting in him was sufficient for eternal life. People say, well, I just need a better prayer life. No, you need the Savior is what you need first. You need to trust him as your Savior. And then you become part of his family. It's great, watch this. You become part of his family. My kids, my two boys at Sanger, they're part of my family. And there is nothing that they can ever do to remove that connection. They can't scrub enough DNA from their body to say that he's not my dad. Now, yeah, we could say all we want. Well, well he, they might say it. Well, they might say it, but it doesn't make it so. Just because you say something doesn't make it true, regardless of what some of the media does. Here's what I'm saying. They will always be my children, no matter what. Now, God forbid they go out and they live a life of carnality and sin and, and they hate me. God forbid. But it doesn't make them any less my child. The Bible says we are kept saved by the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The power of God, not your own power. If you're trusting in your own power, you're trusting in a works gospel which does not save. If you think you can lose your salvation, you might as well try to turn over a new leaf because you're basing it on what you do. The Bible says it's all about what Jesus did. He died on the cross to make the payment for our sin debt because the payment that we made wouldn't be sufficient. That's a works gospel. If you haven't trusted in Christ today, I'm just begging you that you, before you leave this place, that you believe Jesus died for you, that you trust him as your Savior. I pray for that. I'm asking you to do that. And if I haven't scared you away, I hope you come back again next time. I give you five tries. If you, this is one. I give you four more tries. If this isn't the church for you, then, then you don't have to come back. Listen. My hope is that you understand salvation and the security behind it. That we are saved by God's power, born into His family, and nothing shall separate us from the love of God.